It is episode three of the Robbie Fowler podcast. We've been talking about this man at length. And then, by hey presto, here he is. It is the man that Robbie has told me to call the gaffer. I will do that because this man, well, he scares me a little bit being a fellow Scot. Robbie's called you something else. But listen, before we get to that, let's welcome him into the conversation. A footballing legend, a Scotland legend, a Liverpool legend. It is Mr. Graham Souness. And Graham, welcome to the Robbie Fowler podcast. Thank you. That's a furled introduction. I better be good. Yeah, you you will be good. I've got no doubt about that. And and listen, let me start because Robbie's told me to say this to you. He's just called you the Simon Cowell of football, Graham. Your reaction to that? Um, G- Gaffer, before you before you before you carry on though, let me tell you the reason why. <laughs> It, it's, right. not, it's not because you wear your trousers high up or it's the way you dress it's because how incredibly honest you are it's because you say it out like it is and if someone's uh, I always think back to like the X Factor or whatever Simon Cowell does if someone's not good enough he'll tell them <laughs> and it's the attitude where you go away and you improve and come back to me when you're good enough and I think that's what you are as a, as a manager certainly as a you have high expectations and if you don't get to them levels then then you question it so I, I think Simon Cowell of the football world is actually a great analogy well I know where you're coming from but I think it's listen it was it was the way I was brought up in terms of as a child it was a way I would, in the football world it was a very different world today to it was when I was starting off and then ultimately when I get to Liverpool that 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 sense of directness, that sense of honesty prevailed. It was, listen, at Liverpool, the, the, Ronnie Moran and Joe, Joe Fagan would say, look, we've told you once, we've told you twice, we won't be telling you a third time, because if you don't get it after, after us telling you twice, you will not be here very long. And, and I think I've always worked on the premise that honesty is the best, you know, the best way forward, I, and to my detriment, because I think today in the modern game, you have to be a bit of a, a schmoozer, and that's the you have to be someone that's prepared to toe the party line most of the time. And I think you have to tell people what they want to hear, basically. Mm. And everyone's a diplomat today. You know, you you look at the way managers have to be with players today. You know, they're cuddling when they come off. They've had a shit game, but they're putting their arm around them and telling them how well they've done. Um, and that that that's right across the board now. You know, there's there's it's a different. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's the case in every workplace that, that it's a very different relationship today. But that was the way I was brought up, and you know I'm 67 now, so I can't change. Gaffer, you're, change. You're, Gaffer you're never wrong. You, you can't be. Graeme Souris. Graeme Souris. Graeme Souris is never wrong. Yeah. Yeah. I wish. <laughs> I wish. How's life for you? Yeah, I'm doing okay. Uh, I mean, I've been a manager now for a few years. Uh, yeah, doing okay. Enjoy it. And this one, what's, you, I'll, what's my management style? <laughs> you take <them> out? <laughs> I actually, I actually loved the way you managed. I mean, funny enough, before you got on there, I, I like the way you, everyone's different, and I think you're absolutely spot on the way you, the way players are treated. Some players do need that the proverbial, proverbial arm around the shoulder. Some players need to be told, you know, what what they probably need to do better, what they can do better. But I think that's maybe a little bit tougher in today's game so I'm, I'm probably more diplomatic now but because I think you need to in the modern game I think 100%. everyone is everyone is, is is different and everyone will I don't know will, will change their game to the way they see fit but it's different from years ago now I think so you have got to you have to, have to got to be more more arm around the shoulder type of manager you really oh, are 100% you know it's all about keeping them on side and you know, with the way the world is today, and I'm reluctant to use the, the W word, um, you know, everyone has to be more aware of the surroundings and people's feelings, where going back a few decades, no one considered the players' feelings. It was all about, this is the way it has to be, and these are my rules, and we've got to stick to them. It's, it's, it is it's a very, very different workplace. I mean, I, I always, for right or for wrong, I worked on, on, on the premise that, you know, when, when, I, when I was constantly on to players, they would say to me, you know, you're always having to go at me. I said, no, I'm not. I said, the time for you to worry is when I just stop talking to you. That means I've given up on you. That means I, I, I'm, you're not for me. So, you know, there has to be a boss in every, in every walk of life, in every business, every walk of life, there has to be a boss. Um, and the same applies to football. And I'm not, I, 
for me, and again from outside looking in, because I've not been there for what 15 years or so, the tail wags the dog in many cases now. Mm-hmm. The players have so much power um, simply because they're, they, they're, they're such a big asset for the company now. You know, you're talking about players that can be worth 100 million pounds plus. So when push comes to shove and the games are not going well and the results are not going well, the board will look at the asset if he's been parked up on the subs bench and look at the manager and think, who's worth more money to us going forward? And the manager gets the chop. You know, when you walk into the dressing room, I'm sure you're aware of this. You walk into the dressing room today, if you fall out with one, if you have a go at someone at half time, say, you're only just falling out with him. You're falling out with his best mate. And his best mate, there might be four or five players you're falling out with by digging one out. And then and certainly in the Premier League now, you know, the first thing the player does is phone up his agent and say, I can't believe it the way he spoke to me today. Um, and then a few indifferent results. The agent leaks a story to the press, and that all the oldest chestnut in football comes up, always lost a dressing room. That gets back yeah, to the definitely. chairman, chief executive, owner. And for for the manager is on a in Scottish, we say a sugarly peg. His jacket's on a sugarly <laughs> yeah. peg, which means he's you know, a couple of games away from getting getting the bullet. Yeah. Gaffer, is man management more prevalent today then than what it was uh, like, well, yesteryear? I think the first thing, the number one thing you have to get right at a football club, and nobody gets it right all the time. You know, you need a great deal of luck, and that might trivialise it. But for me, and I look back in, in my career and think where I was lucky, where I was unlucky. And I look at some of the big and biggest and best managers that are out there, even before the guys that are, even before the guys that are, are that are involved today. You know, and I'd include Fergie in that. You need you need a large slice of luck. You know, in the right place, right time, right player becomes available. Um, what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just saying it, 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 no, I, I think what you're saying is absolutely spot on because I, I, I liken that to myself. No, that, Robbie, the first thing you have to get right is recruitment. That's, yeah. it. That's what I was going to say. The first thing you have to get right is recruitment and you need a bit of luck with that. Well, you, Gaffer, when you talk about obviously you, you get right to recruitment, but how important is your backroom staff as well? Because when I think of uh, managers going into the game now, they've all got the backroom teams. But years ago, it was just that, like the, the manager would come in on his own and he'd maybe use what's around him. But nowadays, a manager coming in, he'll want to take his own team. Is that is is that like a trust issue because of what we're saying about the the man management style with players? Is it because you don't want that, want that that old coach there because obviously you know he might be there to stab you in the back, and you're you've obviously got that trust with a, within your backroom team anyway. Yeah, I think it's fair to you have people around you that you can trust implicitly. I mean, you you know I don't know what your story is, Robbie. Whether you've taken the same guys with you wherever you've been. Um, yeah, I feel that's important because yeah. the, the management, when it's not going well, is a very, it's a very lonely job. And you've witnessed it, I'm sure, time and time again, where a new manager comes in and he's an open book and he's everyone's mate, and you can, you know, you'll talk to him. Um, he's easy to approach, and then a few bad results, and then he withdraws. And then for the manager, he's thinking, you know, who's leaking the stories to the press? Who's not really with me? Mm-hmm. Uh, and and I would always say. You know, you only find out about people you're working with and players is when you're not winning games. Yeah. Everyone, you hear it all the time. I'm sure you've heard it many times. You hear, well, we've got a really strong dressing room. Where we've got some strong characters in there. You know, let's see if those strong characters are still around when you've lost two or three games back to back at a big club. Yeah. So you don't look for the exit door. But yeah, you've got to have a, board, you've got to have a backroom staff that, that you can trust because as I said, it can be a pretty lonely job at times. Robbie's asked you there, Graham, about man management and the importance of it. I read recently you were saying that, that tactics and, and certainly all the, the reams of columns that are written about tactics, they're a bit overrated. I think you talked about having <laughs> best players work hard and you need that little bit of luck. I also read somewhere that in your seven years at Liverpool, there's only one instance of a tactical reshuffle that Bob Paisley made. Tell us a little bit about that and whether our tactics, do we make too much of them? Can I, I'll, I'll let you into a couple, I've got, you know, I sometimes do Q&As and, and I, I tell this story to begin with. Remind me of the, I'll, okay, I'll start on the tactical bit. So I've been there seven years, we're drawn nil-nil with Bayern Munich, semi-final of the European Cup. We go to the Olympic Stadium and 75,000 people and we go out to warm up and we come back in and 
they had arguably arguably the best midfield player I ever played against. Arguably of that type, a guy called Paul Breitner. I lost it here. Um, mobile ended up going to Real Madrid. Mobile, just a really really good player, hard to you know pin down. And um, we came back in after a warm up, did whatever you know individually we would do. Buzzer goes. We've stood up. We're in a line about to go out the tunnel or into the tunnel. And Bob Paisley stood in front of us. And Bob was a man of few words. And he said, um, stop a minute. Oh, tonight, Sammy, you man mark Paul Breitner. Now, <laughs> if you think of the psychology of that, we've had, all, we've had two weeks between the two games. We've had two weeks to prepare for man marking Paul Breitner. He doesn't choose to do that. He's not woke up that morning and thought, I'll do that. So we never worked on it. We never worked on it, and that was the first thing. We all chuckled. We turned round over our shoulders to look at Sammy, and Sammy, the most honest <laughs> man in the world, yeah, of course, boss, yeah, yeah. And we went out, and he did a great job on him, and we got through to the final. Um, but just going back a couple of questions, when you talk about um, how the game has changed and how, you know, as we'll, we'll, we'll revisit the tactics and all that stuff that you're... But, I go to Liverpool, it's important, I'm not bragging. I go to Liverpool on a record transfer fee between two English clubs. And my first week was Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday off, Thursday, Friday. So Monday was like every other day of training. We walked around Melwood, we jogged around Melwood, did a few stretches, small sided games, a few sprints at the end and home. Then on the Wednesday, we were off. So on the Tuesday night, they took me out to see how much I could drink. <laughs> Um, and then I say Thursday the same Friday and even lighter days training and then on the Saturday we're at West Brom and I'm in the dressing room and it's you know the, the, so we were the, the, the new group coming in and the old boys were still there like I said you know Tommy Smith would be there Clem was there Toshak was there Steve Highway and I'm looking around this dressing room I'm 23 years old that was 23 23 and at 10 to 3, I plucked up enough courage to say to Joe Fagan, I said, Joe, can I have a quick word with you? He said, yeah. He said, what is it, son? I said, look, you know, I've been here a week. No one said anything to me. How is it you want me to play football? How do you want me to play today? He said, in a booming voice, and Robbie will, will tell you, Joe never spoke with a loud voice. He, he said, F off, son. We've paid all this money for you, and you're asking me how to play football. I never in my seven years asked another question at Liverpool. <laughs> they, they made you feel that they kept pushing responsibility back to you. They knew the answers. I mean, there was, there was nobody better around than, you know, Ronnie Moran, Joe Fagan, Bob Pays at that time with the knowledge they had, been in the game for such a long time. And all they did all the time was put the onus back on you, made you man up some. This is all about you. You can't do that today. I, I, to be fair, I actually love that story because it, nowadays we're... If, if you think of the Premier League or any league in football, you you look at the players and if there's anything untowards happening on the match or on the pitch, they're, they're looking over at the at the bench yeah. and asking the question, what should we what should we do or what can we do? When really, when you, you think of that era, you're playing gaffer, uh, you were like you were there to fend for yourself, and and if there was a problem, you you got to try and work things out yourself, and it, it's giving players a little bit of ownership of of what can and and, and should happen in games. You were expected to take responsibility, yeah. You know, and you, and, and that's that, if you've got a few people in your dressing room that are prepared to do that, that's infectious. But everyone, I, you know, I I've worked. I was lucky. I played with some great footballers. You know, big personalities, strong personalities. Um, and it was. I think. The, I think the modern expression would be it was tough love at Liverpool in those days. Mm. You know, and, and can I tell another story about? So that was my first. That was my first game. My last game, European Cup final in Rome against Rome. So we've gone on holiday to Israel for a week. We've come back, trained for three days. We go out to Rome to play the game. We go on a Tuesday afternoon. The Tuesday night we train in the stadium where the game is. On the Wednesday we wake up, and we go on a bus for an hour because the traffic was really heavy in Rome to, to an area we we're going to train on. It turned turned out to be a ploughed field, so we couldn't train on it. No one. You know, you imagine that happening today. No one had, had gone and done a recce on it to see if it was okay for us to train on. Got there and we'd been stitched up. So we just went for a walk, come back to the hotel, hung around for a bit, and then we're having lunch. So we're having lunch, and up to this point, we had never mentioned Roma. 
We'd had a jolly up in Israel for a week. And when I say a jolly up, it was, you know, in those days it was party every night, cruising <laughs> on the beach. And there was a couple of Italian, couple of Italian journalists that turned up to, and they just could not believe it. And I, I invited, I was a captain, I invited them down to the bar every night, 7.30, because we all met up for drinks. Um, at 7.30, before we all went out en masse as a team for dinner. Um, so we get to go to the game now. So we get to this, we get to back to the hotel, hang around for a bit. We're having lunch. And at the end of the lunch, Joe Fagan stood up and he's taken a fork or a knife to a glass and tapped it. And we've all looked up and he said, excuse me, boys, can you leave the room to the waiters? So we're all nudging each other and saying, because we never, ever had team meetings. And we're still, what's he going to say? So he stood up and he starts always a big game tonight, boys. Yeah. Reasonably big, you know, European <laughs> Cup final. Um, and it was evident after 10, 15 seconds, he was talking to himself. <laughs> so he said, he said, um, big game site, these must be a good team. Got three or four World Cup winners in it. A um, couple of good Brazilians. And then there was a pause. Then he said, they're not as good as us. Now remember, the bus leaves at 5.30 tonight, make sure no one's late. <laughs> that was our team talk. <laughs> That was, we never spoke about my game when we got to the stadium for the game. Absolutely nothing. It was all about, we know how good you are. On you go. People wouldn't believe that. You'd believe no. that. Because you know how it, how it was. But no one believes that story. When I, when I relate that to other footballers of my generation and the more modern generations, nah, couldn't have been like that. It was exactly like that. Gaffer, from from when obviously my experience of growing up at Liverpool and, and playing in a team, our emphasis was more on what we can do, always about what we can do, and it was never about the opposition. Mm-hmm. Now, all of a sudden, it became, I don't know, maybe it was scientific or maybe it became like modern football where you've done a lot more work on the opposition. And I remember doing video work for, you know, for a game that we were playing, say we were playing, I don't know, maybe Southampton, Coventry. And you come out of that, that meeting room thinking that you were playing the best team in the world. And also not me, me being disrespectful to Coventry or Southampton or them teams. But when you go out there as a you know as a player and you're seeing all these good things, what the other team can do, that I felt that really had a little bit of a negative effect. Yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think of an analogy. And the best one I can come up with, and I have said this before, when I was at Liverpool, I was friendly with a guy called Bob who worked at Walton Prison, who was a dog handler. You're going to think, where is he going with this story? I had a German Shepherd, and he would he would come round and help me train it. And you train it, you train, you know, the police train them, the prison train them, forces train their dogs where they just cannot be beaten. You know, when you do an exercise with them, if they've you know if they've attacked someone, and you pull the dog off them, the person who's been attacked has to back off. It has to be the dog wins all the time. So in his head, he is invincible. So that's why they're so brave and they're they are what they are. And that's how they made us feel. You know, if you've got a constant worrying about the opposition, oh, we've got to do this, we've got to close that down. We were made to feel the best. Time and time again, and it was generally Ronnie Moran, because, you know, he's, he's the best in the world at you know, hitting us on the head and making us feel bang average. <laughs> so we always have to strive to be better. He would say, we'd be playing a team at Anfield, and he would say 10 minutes before the game, he said, that team across the corridor are sitting in the bottom three. Every chance they only get relegated. But for them today, it's their cup final. This is the game of the season they're going to play in. It's their cup final. Unless you match them for effort, you could lose against them today. And he'd finish by saying, but if you match them for effort, we win easily because you're so good. And it just made you feel that bit special. We were, it was, you know, Ronnie Moran, I have to say, was, I went to his funeral, Robbie, a few years ago. I can't remember if you were there or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll see you. And when I talk about Ronnie Moran, I, I, I say the great Ronnie Moran. And the reason I say that, he, I came away from that. I took my son, James, to the funeral, and we're driving back to Anfield to, to the wake. And I said, think about it, James. He's, he was the single biggest influence on my career. And he said, what do you mean, Dad? And I said, well, he always made, made us and made me feel that I wasn't as good as the players that I've had there in the past. You know, yeah, you're a good team, but you're not, you know, you're not like the team we've had here in the past. Or, yeah, you think you're a good player, but yeah, you should have seen him play. And all the time, they're striving to be better. Now, some players today, I suppose in the past, that's why you're a Liverpool player, wouldn't respond to that kind of chat. 
they would, they would get smaller, whereas the group I played in, it's, it made the guys get bigger. You know, we would, we would say we played a team that was second, third in the league, and we're top. Important game, we've beaten them 4-0. Ron Moran, after the game, when we've all had our shower, we're back in the dressing room. Ron Moran would walk, walk to one side of the dressing room and Joe Fagan would walk to the other. And whatever one, but they've obviously worked out between them, would shout across the dressing room. Ronnie would say, Joe, Joe, we weren't very good today, were we? Move on. Nah, second half, we're disappointing. I thought we could have put our foot in the accelerator. Maybe we've got a few more goals. We look sloppy at the back. And just leave it hanging there. And, you, and you're saying to yourself, We'll just beat them 4 0, a team that might be challenging. You always went away feeling you had a slap around the, the chops from one of those one of those guys. It was, it, it, was, it was always that attitude of know that you can do more and, and get more out of you. And that they, they were never content, they were never happy. You know, you'd hear one of them say, We've won the league, we won the league most years, won the league last day of the season in the dressing room. And it was Ronnie would say it, but it was a quip. He would say, Well, Joe, looks like we've got a contract for next year then. We just won the fucking league. Sorry, just won the league. We've <laughs> you know, got a contract for next year. We actually meant it, and that, that you know they were just the unique characters. Just to go, you know, going back to what's your is he in Belfast, my my, my um, countryman? No, I'm not. I'm in Dubai. Would you believe, Graham? Oh, you're in Dubai. Well, you t- you mentioned something. You got me on a roll, and it, it, it strikes a chord when, when you hear me talk about tactics and formations, and you know that's for the anoraks and. People want to think there's more to the game than actually there exists. And I was watching a game of football two weeks ago. It wasn't very good. And I was flicking the channels and I got to BT. And there was a Jimmy Greaves documentary on it. And I don't know if you've watched it, but it's fabulous. And I, I went to Spurs when I was 15. And I had two years with Jimmy. See, I had two years with Jimmy Greaves. I was at the club for two years. And at 15, I've got nothing to compare it with. But you knew he was a very, very special player. And he was coming to the end of his time at Tottenham. But a unique talent. And it's only afterwards you realise how good he was. But there was a sequence in there, went to Steve Perriman, who ended up captaining the club, playing the same youth team as me. You know, super player, super aggressive, you know, uh, someone you didn't enjoy playing against. And he tells a story that there was a team meeting by the great Bill Nicholson, who did the double with Spurs. And he said, um, Bill was having a team meeting one day and it went on for an hour. And at the end of it, like I do, and I think that, or I didn't, like most managers do, at the end of it, you'd go to maybe two or three of the senior players, have I missed anything? Anything you want to add? So after the team meeting, Bill Nick went to Jimmy Greaves and said, Jimmy, have I missed anything? You want to add something? He said, Bill, he says, Bill, you've just spoke for an hour. Now, this is a legendary manager. Bill, you've just spoke for an hour. I understand why you've had to speak for an hour. But it boils down to the same old thing, Bill. There's people who can play, and there's people that can't effing play. And that was it. So it's never been any different. It's never been any different. Can I ask, Graham, just on that then, because I think we're saying it's a general, a sweeping generalisation to assume that all modern players are, are maybe a little fickle, that they perhaps lack taking that responsibility. Of all the players that you managed in, into your managerial career, who's the one player that you felt, you know what, you could have played back in my day, you will take responsibility? Oh, lo- lots. See, I believe that if you come under the right influence, I mean, my own story, I go to Liverpool, I was a bit of a lad, you know. You know, the social side was more important than the football. And then I was lucky that I went into that environment and come under the influence of really, really top senior professionals. And you'll hear me say this time and time again. As a manager, and, and Robbie, register this. If nothing I've say, I say today registers with you, Robbie. Make sure this registers with you. As a manager, you have got no chance of being successful unless you've got good senior pros. And let me tell you why. If you imagine, if you think of a normal working week for a Premier League manager, you've got them for four days with a day off. So you've got them two hours a day. That's eight hours a week you've got them for. Then you've got them on match days with their heads full of the match. So say there's another hour, say there's another two hours somewhere. You have them for 10 hours a week under your influence. 10 hours. The rest of the time they're mixing with their teammates and hopefully, you know, the right types. And... You know, simple things like turning up on time, training every day as if it's the last day of training you're ever going to have. I mean, if you you came to Anfield, you came to Melwood 
when in my generation, uh, there were once a week there was confrontation. People were being pulled apart, and certainly on match days that was a regular occurrence. And Kenny, who I room with for over ten years, we were pulled apart several times. You know, try to throw punches at each other, and and that that was a, that was the way it was. But you need good senior pros, Robbie, and you've got no chance because you know they. If you make the demands on players, you end up falling out with them. I would imagine it's even worse today than it was in my latter years in management. You know, if you feel it's not right and you're on some all the time, they get cheesed off with you. Your players have to be that influence. I totally relate. And obviously over here, so I'm allowed like five overseas players. Uh, so I've got uh, I've got good overseas players who are experienced and you know know the game. Uh, I th- look, I know I've never really had this conversation with you before, but. I'm like that. I think you, you, the dressing room's got to be massively important. And you said something at the start about to be successful. It is all about the players anyway. So as regardless of you being a great tactical manager or a great technical manager, it doesn't really matter unless you have the, uh, the, the right players to go and do those roles that you want for them. Uh, that might be a, a good player coming in or it might be an experienced player or whatever. But I, I totally agree with you and I think spot on, absolutely spot on. Yeah, I think I come back. You have got the best players, you know. You have got the best players, and and um, it's making sure they're right all the time. You can influence that. And I come back to the senior pros. You know, you have that saying. You, you you know, you train as you play, and the tempo of of training has to be up there. You can't train at seventy five percent and then flick a switch on match day and go to hundred percent. Everything has to be, and you're relying on your you're relying on your your senior players make that yeah, happen. Gaffer, you know that question when you said, you, well, that, that answer you're giving us there, so not every player is like that, though. What are you saying in terms of train the way you play? I'll be honest with you, I wasn't that type of person, whereas... <laughs> Good honesty, I never, Rob. No, I, I never trained like I played, and, and uh, that is just me and the, the way I felt, and uh, I know some players need to do that to, to go with the right action, but I, I was, like, maybe confident enough to go into games believing that I was better anyway but without doing it all in training. Does that make sense? And I, I hope that doesn't sound like a little bit of a bit of a, a big-headed player. But I was that player who, who maybe took it easy through the week and then maybe changed my attitude towards the game. And look, rightly or wrongly, that that was just how I felt. I think, I think um, without, you know, blowing smoke where I shouldn't blow it, you had a, you know, like all the great strikers, you had a sixth sense, you know, to be in the right place at the right time. I get, I get what you're saying. I'm, I'm thinking for, for me personally, and for defenders anyway. Kenny was always, yeah. he wasn't the best trainer. Kenny, Rushy was. Oh, you, he'd be the last pick in a five aside. You want on your team? <laughs> He's hopeless. But, but for me, I, I had to feel aggressive all the time. You know, I, I, was, yeah. I, I can remember a, a story about you, and uh, I was a reserve game at Anfield one night, and it was misty, and there was a corner at the cop end, and the balls gone into the box and there's like a load of players and you're struggling to see but the ball ends up in the back of the net and no one knew who, and I turned away I said well you know who scored that and that was you you know you just I said I know who scored that you know the ball went into a group of players and you poked it in and it's just that sixth sense that the top top strikers have um, they, see the, they see the game differently at that particular moment so I get what you're saying but for me personally I had to feel you know I had to be on it all the time yeah. What what yeah, about Graham? You you had so many highs in in your career. I mean, so many blooming highs. Whether it was at Liverpool, Coppa Italia victory over in Italy, a Scottish Premiership win up in my neck of the woods with Rangers. Your lowest ebb, though, Graham. And, and I hate to go negative, but the, the time where you were maybe disenchanted with the game or or a moment that has really stuck with you all these years. Um, that's quite simple. Um. My time at Liverpool yeah. in the story that appeared in the Sun newspaper. That was, that was, listen, I, looking back in my career, I, I always, I, I never really did any due diligence on jobs I was offered. And I think, you know, I've gone to Rangers that were struggling, gates of 16,000, within a couple of months we had it up to a full house of 45,000 at the time. Win the league the first year. You don't get a job at a football club unless there's issues, unless there's problems. Very rarely, very, you know, very rarely do, do people leave when the club is flying and take another job. So 
I'm at Rangers for five years. We've done the hard bit. We won it the first year. Um, and then we, I think, this Terry Butcher break a leg. And the second year, we don't win it. But then so the third, fourth, and fifth year, we do win it again. So, and then it went on to be nine in a row. So we'd, I'd, I'd done the hard work. I got my, and, and I, was, I was under pressure in, in Scotland because for, you know, you, you may remember it. You know, I, I was now manager and I was getting banned from the touchline. I was falling out with everyone. And it was a case of, I was no longer on the back pages. I was, I was on the front page of newspapers. I'd split from my first wife. I was on my own. Um, and Liverpool job is offered to me. And I said no, and that was offered to me again. I said no. Now I have an incident at St. Johnston with a tea lady who comes into the dress room and Aggie, God rest her soul, she died a couple of years ago. I'm not going to say bad things about her now, but that was an overreaction to some mud on the floor. So then I had a confrontation with the, the chairman of St. Johnston at the time. And I thought, you know what? This is no longer for me. And I phoned up, it was um, Jim Kenefick, who was Peter Robinson's big mate. I said, Jim, if that job, he died a couple of years ago as well. I said, I'll come and speak to you, Jim, if that job's still an offer. And, and I met, I went down and met them and I agreed to join them. And, and that, was an, that was a mistake because I'd done the hard work at Rangers. What I should have done is taken a back seat for a, couple of, for a year if I wanted to go back into management because I was the second largest shareholder at Rangers at the time and just maybe enjoyed some of the, the fruits of my endeavours. I didn't. I always felt I'd get the Liverpool job at some time. Um, for me, it was a wrong, the right club at the wrong time. You know, obviously within a year I'm having open heart surgery, so there's something going on there. I think Liverpool was a difficult job for anyone taking it on at that time. I hadn't won a trophy for a, a couple of years. Um, and the mistake I made, one of the biggest mistakes I made was was trying to do too much too soon. You know. You had the likes of Robbie coming through, Jamie Redknapp coming through, Macca coming through. I should have bided my time, but I wanted it to be instant. Um, and then the sun thing is a thing that I'll be remembered for in Liverpool. You know, it wasn't something that um, I was aware of. You know, I was in hospital when they printed that story. And, and I've got to believe it was a complete accident because at the time, Mike Ellis, bloody hell, I'm saying he died, he died a couple of years ago. <laughs> Everyone... <laughs> Don't be my pal at all time. <laughs> um, he died a couple of years ago. Mike Ellis was a local, local Sun journalist and he had gone on holiday. And, um, and they printed that story on a Wednesday, which was the anniversary of Hillsborough. But to give you a wee bit of background to that, it was the FA Cup semi final. And we've drawn 1 1 with Portsmouth at Highbury, Arsenal's old ground. And then I was diagnosed with having this operation to have this uh, with coronary artery disease. And then the Ended up having an operation on the following Tuesday. The following Monday was the, the replay of the FA Cup semi final at Aston Villa's ground. And they said to me, Come have a picture. I said, Well, only if we win. So I'm in hospital. Um, the game goes to extra time, it goes to penalties. And then there's a picture of me with my girlfriend at the time, who's now been my wife for 28 years. And the picture, so would it be? is to miss the deadline for the Tuesday and I went in on the Wednesday and I come back to Mike Ellis being away on holiday so he would have pointed out to the people who were making that decision he cannot put that picture in on Wednesday so I, I'm oblivious I don't know I'm still all drugged up in hospital I don't know what's happening and that picture appeared on the Wednesday and, and unfortunately for me and I'm a big boy I'll take my medicine and, and, and deserve every criticism going for it but it wasn't a decision made by me yes should I have said no to having a picture taken. Yes. Was I aware of the, the feelings towards the Sun newspaper in Liverpool? No, given that I had been in Scotland when all this was going on. And and it was um, a really difficult time for me. So what I should have done, I should have just resigned immediately after that, but I didn't. And I, I felt after that, I was it was always a very difficult job and it was going to be impossible for me to crack after that. Gaffer, just uh, obviously a little bit of a thing what you just said there about obviously that's the only thing Liverpool fans will you remember look there will be certain fans who will bring her up and mention it but look trust from me and there's many many Liverpool fans who absolutely love what you've done and what you are and who you are the type of person you are as a player and certainly as a manager um, I mean I'll, I'll put my hand up and, and 
say, obviously very, very instrumental in sort of helping me um, in my career and massively grateful for that. And there's massively many, many grateful fans for what you was as a player and what you was as a manager. So take that, what, what I'm saying to you is, um, you know, as a real honest person saying people will remember it, but you're not remembered for that. You're remembered for being oh, great to an unbelievable for great player. Thanks for seeing and, uh, Gaffer, just want another thing. What you were saying there about maybe taking the Liverpool job too quick. Again, from a selfish point of view, from my, I'm glad you did because if you hadn't have come in, I'm, I might not have got a look in. So again, that's selfish from my point of view. I'm so not have, having a belief in and and the, and the attitude in, in believing I was a, a good enough player for you. Well, without and then, of course, the people are, are not. Well, one's not around to to. Um, it's a couple around, but there's one not around in particular who didn't think you were ready. And I said, he's ready. And yeah. that's when we threw you in. And then Fulham, wasn't it? Debbie Fulham. Fulham, Fulham. Yeah. Fulham. <laughs> Yeah. Well, f- funny enough, Gaffer, just before you come on, I, w- I was telling the story. So uh, the first year of the uh, the Premier League, I was actually sub the last game of the season, which was against uh, Tottenham. We won 6-2. Uh, and I had, it was only the time when we only had two subs. And I was sub because, for, for whatever reason, I don't know. Uh, and I never got on. And in a way, I'm glad I never got on because... What you just said, I probably wasn't ready. I didn't think I was ready that particular time. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously glad you had the foresight to think a few months later I was actually, uh, I was ready. And, and thankfully I, I didn't look back. So, yeah. <laughs> You've made me a happy man. You've made me a happy man today. Was it four goals you got against Thorne? Was it four? Uh, <laughs> no, you, you, well, I can't believe you took a goal away from me, Gaffer. Don't tell me it was five. <laughs> It was five, yeah. It was five. Oh, it, it was. <laughs> five. Gaffer, just, just to tell you that quick story about that uh, that game. So, obviously, the first game was a 3-1 win yeah. uh, up at uh, Craven Cottage. And the second leg, which was which was ironically my first game at Anfield. And I, I go back to the stories you tell about, you know, all the great Liverpool coaches, the, the, the Joe Fagans, the Ronnie Morans. And uh, I remember after the, uh, the the game at Anfield, we won five nil. I scored the five goals, so I'm coming <laughs> off the pitch thinking I'm the best player the world's ever seen. And I goes in the dressing room, and I'm sitting down, and I'm wanting yourself, I'm wanting Ronnie, I'm wanting Roy, uh, and everyone to tell me, you know, I'm better than Rushy, I'm this and I'm that. And Ronnie, when I just turned round to me, he went, "You should have had six, you spotty little basket." And I went, "Brilliant!" And I, I love telling people that story because that is what Ronnie Moran was all about. He was always wanting you to to go out there and get better. Oh, he was, he was, he was unique. He was, you know, we used to say about Ronnie, he was, he's, he was happy being unhappy. <laughs> and, 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 but it was all a game. I mean, he was, he was a good man. He really was a good man. That's a major influence on me. Major influence. I've got to tell a Ronnie Moran's story. At the end of each season, you know, for one in the league, um, he didn't get the medal at the end of the season. So you go away for a holiday, come back, do a pre-season, Sometime in that period, the first two weeks of pre-season, you'd be sitting in the dressing room after a session, you'd been down to Mel, would come back, sitting there. He would come in with an old wooden cardboard box, place it on the massage table in the middle of the home dressing room at Anfield and say, oh, there's, there's, there's some males in there for last year, uh, if you think you deserve one. <laughs> then he'd walk out and would count one. To, it was always somewhere between sort of five and seven seconds. His head would pop back around the door <laughs> and he'd say, by the effing way, we get nothing this year for what's in that box. And it was... <laughs> it was genius, that. It was, it it's absolutely unique. genius. It was totally unique. Brilliant. It was good, good. They were great days. They were great days. I love the start of it, G- G- Gaffer. I-, I love the way you said at the start of it. If we won the league, it wasn't if it was. Well, when, I, I want it. Last couple from us because I'm conscious of time, and I know you've got training, Robbie. And the Gaffer can't be late for goodness sake for training. There- there's a theme that's emerged, and-, and I did this last week with Jurgen Klopp. I waited till the end. I can do it now with you, Graham. I've got to admit to you that I am a Man United fan, Graham. I'm sorry to do that to you. Now. What the theme of this right. interview has been is, is you've talked about taking responsibility, that players, perhaps some today, don't do that. Now, you have had this wrong, long-running kind of battle saga, if you will, with a certain Paul Pogba. And Robbie was remarking before you came on air, it's you probably are a big fan. You probably rate him 
what what the big issue for you is it's the mentality you don't see him really putting it in 90 minutes week after week after week is that accurate Graham is, is your kind of frustration at Paul is the fact that you see a heck of a player there you just you just question whether 100% you know it's, it's what I said 10 minutes ago you know the time for a player yeah. to worry when I was working as a coach is when I stopped talking to them that means I'd give up on them Listen, there's no doubt in Paul's qualities. They're, they're unique qualities. But, you know, it's a bit like uh, Jack Grealish. I think he's had a fabulous year because for me, he's sprinting is quickly going back towards his own goal now. He's just going another way. He's putting a shift in now for the cause. There's no doubt in their qualities. Paul Pogba's Paul got unique qualities. Got another wonder goal last night. And he's, he's, the, he's the difference in big games. My, my mm. criticism of his was he didn't work hard enough for, for the cause. And his teammates, but I, 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 you would not find me question his his raw ability. It's up there. Anyone, anyone you want to name around today, but um, I just, I just want more from him because he's that good. He could be the difference in, in most games. He's got that much quality, and it's all about the work rate and what he was doing. Yeah, I think what I'm saying is what he was doing without the ball. You know, you're putting a shift in because. It only takes in the modern game everyone's a high press, high press. It only takes one person not to get involved in that, and the whole press breaks down. And I would uh, the simplest way, and I've, you know, you get to my age, I've got a story for every occasion. I can remember it was imprinted in my head when I was 15 or 16 years old that you sprint back towards your own goal as you do sprinting forward, going forward. And it was Bill Nick in a meeting with the youth team saying, if you need an example, look at a guy called Ray Bunkle. Now, you will never have heard of Ray Bunkle. That name, he played in the reserves. That name is stuck in my head all my career until, until today. And that, I learned that very early on. And that stuck with me forever and ever. You know, you sprint back as quickly as you sprint forward. And, and, yeah. and I didn't see that in, in, in Paul Pogba, but there's no doubt about it. The, the man's got unique talents. And listen, speaking on behalf of the majority, I think, of Man United fans, completely can't argue with that. At times, you've had to question his appetite for doing the dirtier side of, of the game that perhaps he doesn't want to get involved in. He's more of a of a flash player. Listen, Rob, I'm conscious of your time. I've got to ask, Robbie's obviously cutting his managerial teeth. Incidentally, Graham, he's seven matches unbeaten over in the Indian Super League. Another young man cutting his managerial teeth that I've got to get your thoughts on is Steven Gerrard. Because what are Rangers now... 18 points clear at the top of the mm-hmm. Scottish Premiership. Celtic bidding for 10 in a row. Stephen looking as if he's going to stop them doing that. Is he destined for bigger and better things in his managerial career? Well, I don't think it's bigger and better than, than Rangers. I mean, Rangers, is a, do you know if you're Scottish, is a monster football club. You know, don't underestimate the size of Glasgow Rangers. Yeah. You know, if, if it was a level playing field, if they had the same money coming in from television is the big clubs in England and they were playing the Premier League, they'd be challenging for, the, for that title. Make no mistake about that. You know, history has been unkind to them, the way the game's evolved in Scotland and the way the, the money has been introduced through television into the English game. Getting back to Stephen, he's done a wonderful job. If you go back to last year, when they played Celtic, they were better than Celtic. But, would, you know, they came back from Dubai very much in it um, <clears throat> this time last year and blew up for whatever reason. You have to say this year they've been sensational. Yeah. And the consistency, and that's how you win leagues. You'd also have to factor in that Celtic have just imploded. You know, they've just imploded both on the field and off the field. But um, no, he's done a great job. Because difficult time at Rangers. He went in there at a very difficult time. So, yeah, he's done a great job. But it's not about bigger and better when you leave Glasgow Rangers. It's a different challenge. Yeah, it is. I, my, I take that point. And I do my, take that I, point. I was a Rangers supporter as a boy. That's, that, that was my first love. And then obviously you look for all the results that the clubs you've been involved with through your career. And the first two I look for is Liverpool and, and Rangers. Slightly, Rangers slightly first, sorry to say that. Yeah, good. 
Absolutely. Sorry, sorry, Gaffer. Ga- sorry, Gaffer. We'll, we'll just cut that bit off. We'll that bit. <laughs> I, I want to finish. I want to finish if I can, Graham. Robbie started this interview by saying that. Listen, he's likened you to, to the Simon Cowell of the footballing world. In, Robbie, in, in a good way, though. In, in a, a good, good way. way yeah. In, in a good, good way. way. Of course, important. We point that out. Robbie also told us a lovely tale about the, the time. I think you were over in Ireland and you put your arm around him. Uh, it was early morning. You were flying back to Liverpool and you, you gave him a Guinness. And, and what was Graham? What was Gaffer eating, Robbie? Oysters. Oysters at 7.30 in the morning, Gaffer. The whole world was a glass of champagne, was it? <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you, no, you had a champagne, but you give me a Guinness. You give me a Guinness. <laughs> probably because I was hollow and I was, I was so skinny, I probably needed to bulk up a yeah. little bit. But that was yeah. obviously one of the, the um, not impressions you, because I knew what you was and what type of man you are anyway. But I remember you having uh, oysters at 7.30 in the morning and you give me an oyster, so... Thank you for that. You still eat them? I, I, I actually not, not not all the time. Now and again, but whenever I think, whenever anyone gives me oysters, I always think about you, Gaffer. Good man. Just just for, for seven thirty, <laughs> seven thirty in the morning in Dublin Airport eating oysters. It must have been a big night the night before then. <laughs> to bed. Uh, well, phenomenal. Yeah, well, that was a big morning then. Big morning. Yeah. Yeah. Phenomenal. Listen, Graham, uh, we can't thank you enough. You know, uh, and again, Robbie, you know him well. You don't know f- me for Adam. Uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed listening to you, Graham. We could listen to you all day long, for goodness sake. You, you're a man that understands the game. Of course, you do. You've been hugely successful in it. For what it's worth, I think you speak plenty of sense. Uh, and you, you certainly come across as, as someone who wholeheartedly loved the game and, and still continues to do so today. So, Graham Souness, Liverpool legend, Rangers legend, Scotland legend as well. Thank you so much for your time. No, it's Thanks, been great. Um, it's been a pleasure, guys. Robbie, the best of luck out there, pal. Maybe our paths will cross and we can have a... You can have a Guinness and I'll have a glass of something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, best I'll, of luck, I'll look you, pal. Cheers, best boss. Thank you. Here. Absolute pleasure. Absolute pleasure. What an absolute treat that was. Graham Souness.